Well, it's been a little while since our last Bleach battle analysis. I had wanted to keep up with the fights as they played out in the Thousand Year Blood War anime, but I sort of fell behind. There's just so much to talk about at the moment. But thanks to the anime being on a break this past week, we have the chance now to dive into another fight from the second Quincy invasion. Mayuri Kurotsuchi vs Giselle Jewel and the Battle of the Zombie Armies. This is one of the strangest, most twisted fights in the Thousand Year Blood War arc that stands out, though, for being a fully formed fight amongst the weirdness of the second half of the invasion, while at the same time going a little underappreciated, I think. It doesn't help that as far as Myri fights go in this arc, this battle is completely overshadowed, and rightfully so, by his later fight against Pernida, which is just much better overall. However, this fight is fun too in its own right. Myri is a divisive character. I think you either love him or you simply can't stand him. Personally, I've always really enjoyed the Mad Scientist, but after his close call against Uryu in the Soul Society arc, Kubo started to take a different approach approach to Myori's fights. As the Soul Society's foremost scientist, Myori has an answer to each and every tactic or special ability his opponent can throw at him, and in that regard, this fight against Giselle is very typical Myori fair. Whether that's a good thing or not is going to be up to you, but once again he inexplicably has a counter for everything that comes up in this battle, which I think can get a little old, unlike the clash against Pernida where we see a Myori that's backed up against a wall and forced to a adapt on the fly versus a foe that really does outclass him. Meanwhile, as a result of Myri having such control over this battlefield, there really aren't any stakes to be had in this fight against Giselle. Never once did I really believe Myri was in any danger whatsoever. It took this fight, I think, for me to realise that stakes were what I really wanted from a Myri battle in the future. But no, what makes this fight worth talking about is its central gimmick the necromantic powers of Giselle, her shrift, the zombie, and the way this fight acted as a vehicle for bringing back characters from the grave. It's a cavalcade of cameos, basically. So, without further ado, let's take a look at Myri vs Giselle, and everyone else that joins in along the way. However, before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video when you're done with it, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support me and the channel. And if you want to take that support for me another step further, I do also have a Patreon as well. And as always, I want to say an enormous thank you and give a huge shout out to everyone supporting you there over on Patreon. I really do appreciate each and every one of you every single time. It really does mean the world to me. So thank you you all so very much. And of course, there will be spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War arc of Bleach in the video to come, particularly for the parts of the series that haven't yet been animated. Myori vs Giselle is one of the last fights to take place in the second Quincy invasion, and honestly feels like kind of an odd fit. A battle that takes place out of some kind of necessity. Did Myori really need two fights in this arc, especially when his next battle is so good? Probably not, but Kubo clearly wanted to bring some deceased characters back, and what better way to do so than through Myri? This is definitely an odd one. Myri feels like a spectator for a big chunk of the battle, as both he and Giselle control their combatants from afar, like puppets on strings. Of course, that is one of the many connections between these two fighters. This isn't a mirror match in the same vein as Myri vs Xyloporo, where they're both simply just insane scientists for their respective factions. This is a mirror match in a slightly more interesting way. Both Myri and Giselle are viciously cruel and sadistic masters who control their subordinates through abusive relationships and degrading punishment. It's definitely strange seeing Myri being portrayed as the more mellow character here, but I suppose comparing Myri to Giselle is a decent barometer for how Myri has changed over the course of the series. Whether Myri's development or rehabilitated image is deserved or not is again going to be up to you. Giselle, along with Bambietta, is the only member of the Bambis to have two fights, this being Bambietta's second as well. It makes me wonder what came first in Kubo's creative process, realising he had a character who could raise the dead in Giselle, and so deciding to bring back several Aran to battle her, or wanting to bring back several characters from past arcs and therefore creating Giselle to facilitate that fight scenario. 
I imagine it's probably the latter, as this fight answered one of the biggest, most long-standing questions in Bleach. What was inside Xyloporo's lab in the Waco Mundo arc? And to be honest, I'm kind of grateful this fight exists purely on the basis that it gave us that answer after so many years. The fight itself is fairly long, spanning from chapter 588 all the way to 594, all while remaining mostly unbroken. There are a couple of outside scenes peppered throughout, but for the most part we stick with this fight until the very end. Or we nearly do, anyway, as the fight fractures weirdly by the time we reach the finish line, meaning it doesn't technically end until chapter 596, but we'll get to that later. As I said, this battle is mostly used by Kubo as a vehicle for a lot of fun cameos from characters past, characters long thought to be deceased, and while I really do like the idea of a fight that enables the return of dead characters, None of the returning faces are really what I would call fan favourites. In fact, one of the zombies, Charlotte Coolhorn, doesn't even really make sense to be here at all, and I think is only present in this fight so Kubo can make some kind of a connection between him and Giselle. If Charlotte was here for Yumichika's sake, then why not bring back Poe for Ikaku too? Or hell, since Mayuri was able to find and resurrect the half-obliterated corpse of Lupi, why not somebody like Edrad? Now, I'm not saying the returning characters absolutely had to be fan favourites, but it does feel like an opportunity was missed here for some even more shameless fan service. If Mayuri scoured the leftovers of the fake Karakura Town battle, why did he choose Charlotte over the countless other dead Fraction? Why not add Stark to his Kurotsuchi corpse unit for some real power? And then there's Giselle. I like that she was mostly collecting Shinigami corpses, but I remember really hoping back in the day she'd recovered the bodies of, you guessed it, Kangdu and BG9 too at some point, among other Quincy's. Speaking of which, let's take a look at who's involved here. With this fight being what it is, the list of characters involved is quite astonishing. And interestingly, most of them get at least something to do here. On the side of the Shinigami, Mairi and Nemu are leading the charge, and seeing the two of them working well together like this feels like a precursor for their much bigger fight to come. Speaking of a duo working well together, this battle is actually initiated by Ikaku and Yumichika, who play a really weird role in the Thousand Year Blood War arc in general. Never have they felt more like secondary characters than they do in this arc. They never really receive any of the focus, yet they're always there regardless, hanging around. They're very briskly beaten twice in this battle, reduced to the sideline support squad, and that's kind of where they stay for the rest of the arc. Oddly enough, they continue to follow Mayuri around too, but they do have a really nice emotional moment in this fight which I think works really well. And then there's Mayuri's corpse unit, made up of dead Arankar whose bodies he collected over the course of the Arankar arc. There's the Priveron, Espada, Dordoni and Serucci who are harvested by the Exequius after their losses, their corpses then taken by Xyloporo for his research. There's also Lupi, who feels like a really odd inclusion to me. The former sixth Espada that took Grimajo's place briefly, the upper half of his body was completely destroyed by Grimjo Cero, yet he's here and he seems to be functioning absolutely fine. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, we have Charlotte Coolhorn, one of Barragan's six Fraction, all of whom should have left corpses on the battlefield, save for maybe Geo Vega, who was reduced to atoms by Soifon Shikai. So Mayuri had his pick of the litter when it came to bodies, I'm surprised that he really got so few. Meanwhile, over on the side of the villains, I feel like Giselle was probably a very convenient character for Kubo to have, as her mere existence helps him tie up a lot of the loose ends that naturally presented themselves as the war waged on. Matsumoto has been missing for 50 chapters? Not to worry, Giselle picked her up at some point off screen, and now she's back as a zombie. But as I mentioned in my last few videos, Giselle is my favourite member of the Bambis. The character is depraved, but also a lot of fun. Then of course there's Giselle's many zombie commanders. The zombified Bambietta, or Zombietta, where her character takes a bit of a beating in this fight. The zombified Hitsugaya, which is an awesome twist and of course payoff for that cliffhanger that happened many chapters ago after his fight with Kang Du. And finally the zombified corpses of Rangiku, Kensei and Rose, 
all of whom show up right at the very end of the fight itself. So yeah, there's a lot going on here, a lot of characters involved. It has the potential to be pretty messy, but actually I think Kubo does a solid job at keeping everything contained, at least until all of the zombie stuff begins to spill over into other fights later on. Anyway, let's take a look now at the battle itself. For some pre-fight context before this battle takes place, numerous Shinigami and Sternritter prepare to face off in a massive skirmish as the Gotei 13 step in to defend Ichigo from the Quincy assault. However, as Yuhabak ascends to the royal palace, the sheer force of his immense power creates a colossal shockwave that sends everyone flying, scattering the fighters across the battlefield. It would have been nice, of course, if we'd been able to see this skirmish play out, or perhaps even better if we'd seen the fruits of this separation explored a bit more. As it stands, of all the fights that are set up in this moment, Giselle's battle is really the only one that amounts to anything good. We first see Giselle being cornered by Ikaku and Yumichika, Ikaku brandishing the blade of Hozaki Maru Shikai in Giselle's face. Giselle is trying on her usual act, attempting to get them to attack her by using reverse psychology, but unlike the previous Squad 11 members she fought, Ikaku and Yumichika are a little more level-headed about the situation. Admittedly, if it's as simple as merely needing to splash a Shinigami with her blood in order to turn them into a zombie, I'm surprised Giselle doesn't just quickly cut herself on Hozaki Maru's edge and then flick her blood at the two of them. Ikaku especially feels like he's been shoved down a tier of importance in the overall cast hierarchy, so it's nice for them to get at least this short fight. Giselle keeps trying to get them to slash her, but before long, Yumichika somehow guesses exactly what her ability is before continuing to unravel her act by outing that she's actually a man. Giselle's enormous shocked reaction that depicts her as being completely speechless in how to respond on the next page should have told me everything I needed to know, but as I mentioned in my Bambi's video back in the day, I thought Yumichika was simply trying to get under her skin by insulting her. That's absolutely his style, but thinking back on it, it would have been a very random insult for him to make. Usually Yumichika's taunts are very superficial and surface level, aimed at someone's beauty or their ugliness to go with his narcissistic and shallow personality, but here he claims Giselle smells like a man and apparently that's enough to give the game away. Kubo would later confirm that Giselle is indeed biologically male, but the character does clearly identify as a woman. And to be honest, I never really understood what the point of this moment was in regards to the bigger picture. Personally, it doesn't change the fact that I really enjoy the character and it doesn't seem to impact the character much either other than getting her really annoyed. So it's hard to know what Kubo's trying to say, if anything, but in the short term it does just seem to mostly be a conduit to annoy Giselle enough to get her to kickstart the fight. Speaking of which, clearly rattled by Yumichika's claims, Giselle shrieks for Bambietta and the self-proclaimed leader of the Bambis arrives, leaping into the air behind them and launching a barrage of bombs at Ikaku and Yumichika. As the two Shinigami are swallowed up by the explosion, Bambietta is revealed, but she's not quite how you remember her. Gone is that fiery personality from before. In its wake is a cold, dead-eyed stare, discoloured skin and a vacant silence. The first zombie has arrived, and the battle begins in earnest. As we venture into the next chapter, Ikaku and Yumichika, apparently unharmed from that first blast, flee from several more massive explosions. While Ikaku wonders if Bambietta simply has an endless supply of bombs at her disposal, Yumichika, apparently the shrift whisperer these days, also correctly deduces what Bambietta's power is too, letting Ikaku know that he won't be able to deflect her reishi with his zanpak toe. Choosing instead then to simply leap into action, Ikaku in a manner very reminiscent of Zaraki decides that means he simply has to cut Bambietta up while avoiding the reishi blasts, 
turning and lunging towards the stern ritter. Giving Ikaku covering fire from the ground, Yumichika uses Hado 57 Daichi Tenyo to hoist chunks of debris into the air and throw the rubble towards Bambietta, ensuring her reishi connects with the rocks instead of Ikaku himself. It's a nice short piece of choreography. It's great seeing Ikaku and Yumichika, who have been one of the most enduring duos in the series, working well together like this, pairing Ikaku's strike first, ask questions later mentality with Yumichika's more strategic approach. It's also fascinating to see Yumichika openly using Kido in front of Ikaku, who either doesn't notice or simply doesn't care. If only Ikaku felt the same way about using his Bankai. Considering at this point they're not aware of anyone else being in the vicinity, I'm surprised he doesn't unleash it, even if only for old time's sake. However, their plan is a success. Ikaku reaches Bambietta in the sky and drives his blade through her throat. Again, I appreciate the no mercy approach here. Ikaku's face is splashed by some of Bambietta's blood before she grabs his cheek and prepares to turn his head into a bomb itself. Luckily, Yumichika arrives and slices off her arm. Again, another piece of cool choreography, as the reishi Bambietta was holding goes flying, detonating the ground in a violent fireball. Honestly, I'm not sure how this works. It's been noted many times that Bambietta's The Explode doesn't just throw bombs. Instead, she actively turns anything her reishi is embedded into into a bomb. So surely when her arm is severed from her body and she loses control over that blast, presumably she's not paying attention to it, the reishi ball that goes flying would simply remain a ball of reishi and not detonate? Because if it hits the floor and blows up regardless of whether or not Bambietta is controlling it still, then it really is just a bomb after all. However, Giselle picks up Bambietta's severed arm and tells Ikaku and Yumichika that Bambietta has been dead a long time and thus can't be killed again, as Bambietta readies another bomb, detonating the blast in front of Ikaku and Yumichika at point-blank range, sending the two of them crashing into the ground below, their bodies charred and smoking. I appreciate that despite their power, Ikaku and Yumichika are no match for a stern ritter, even a dead one, though admittedly they were holding back a fair bit too. Also, we'll discuss this again later, but Bambietta's strength seems to be all over the place in this fight. Here, she's dominating these two as you'd probably expect, but later she is completely trampled by Charlotte while she's using her Volston dish, and Charlotte himself was earlier killed by Yumichika. Anyway, as Ikaku and Yumichika lie helpless on the ground, Giselle explains Bambietta's current situation, revealing that it's difficult for her to transform her fellow Quincy's into zombies. In order to do so, they need to be dead first. So Giselle murdered the injured Bambietta after her battle with Komamura before turning her into her slave. In another admittedly pretty unexpected moment, Giselle reveals that she was extremely turned on by Bambietta's face as she begged her not to kill her, and then presumably while she killed her as well. Giselle really is unlike any character Kubo has ever created before. In many ways, I feel like she was a vessel for him to really push boundaries with, to shock the audience again and again. I mean, Bleach has had its fair share of fan service in the past, but it's never been so overtly sexual in its subject matter before. There's definitely the implication that Giselle is some kind of a deviant who relishes in and gets off on warped, taboo love and control. But I mean, that's also partly why I find the character to be so fascinating. I appreciate Giselle could easily be too much for some, but this is definitely one of the darkest characters in Bleach, dealing with some really adult themes that go way beyond the typical cartoon comic violence the series normally depicts or what you'd at least expect from it anyway. Again, though, I'm not really sure what Kubo was trying to say with this character. The reasoning behind Giselle's behaviour becomes a little clearer once Mayuri gets involved, and it becomes obvious, I think anyway, that Kubo wanted to depict a different twist on an abusive, controlling relationship to mirror that which Mayuri and Nemu once had. Anyway, Giselle does what I think she probably should have done immediately once confronted, slice open her finger and prepare to drip blood onto Ikaru. Kaku and Yumichika turning them into zombies as she reveals that where Shinigami are concerned, she simply needs to splash them with blood and they become hers, as we saw earlier in the arc. 
However, before she can do so, a brilliant light gleams into existence behind her as Mayuri Kurotsuchi arrives, looming over the battlefield like a heavenly messenger in his glorious sunsuit. Mayuri declares Giselle's power to turn her enemies into zombies to be interesting, giving her the mad scientist seal of approval. I like the detail that Mayuri is literally shining so brightly that no one can even see him. I assume he's paranoid about having darkness anywhere near him when actually out on the battlefield. Speaking of which, I do wonder what actually got him to leave his laboratory. Though he's back again now, Kisuke leaves briefly too to collect Ichigo and the others, and they leave Akon in charge, I presume, with both lead scientists gone. Mayuri's reason for venturing out could just be general curiosity, I suppose. Before anything can happen, however, Bambietta returns, appearing in front of Giselle as if to protect her. I really like how Kubo depicts Giselle in these moments, clinging to Bambietta's back like a leech, using her as a shield. It's interesting, though. Giselle clearly isn't a totally useless fighter as she engages Ichigo with her bare hands and then later a bow and arrow. However, before she does anything else, Bambietta turns to Giselle, drooling, telling the Sturmritter that she desperately needs something of hers, that she can't go on without it. Again, the scene is implicitly sexual in nature, the idea being that Giselle has programmed her zombie slaves to want her or some aspect of her physically. Though, of course, this is a red herring. Bambietta is actually after Giselle's blood, but Giselle seems to relish the thought of it being something else. However, Giselle brutally smacks Bambietta across the face, scolding her for being insatiable. Grabbing Bambietta by the hair, Giselle lifts her face to meet her gaze and tells her that she'll receive her treat when the battle is over. Bambietta sobs, blood running down her face as she begs for forgiveness, a monstrous look spreading over Giselle own face as she clearly loves what she's seeing. Supposedly, this zombified version of Bambietta is a portion of her actual personality, which Giselle is clearly taking advantage of. However, Mayuri isn't disgusted by this display. In fact, he likes what Giselle has going on, in an obvious reference to his once vile treatment of Nemu, though of course we're supposed to believe they've somehow moved past that by this point. Like I said earlier, it's weird to think someone else is being portrayed as a dark reflection of Mayuri of all characters, but that's clearly what Kubo is going for with with Giselle in this moment. Mayuri then tones down his brightness, calling Giselle lowly, which causes her to attack. To me, Giselle seems to be very thin-skinned. It's interesting that every time someone insults her, she immediately goes on the offensive. Bambietta unleashes a hail of bombs at Mayuri, but the captain leaps out of the way as they explode. As Giselle and Bambietta give chase, Mayuri instructs Nemu to prepare a device for a counter-attack. And this is a brilliant example of what I detailed at the top of the video, how Mayuri has an answer for everything in the blink of an eye. Nemu happens to be carrying with her some kind of briefcase computer with which she controls the input of these devices that Mayuri is about to use. Mayuri then, from seemingly nowhere, tosses a bunch of orbs into the air. Bleach's take on Pokeballs, I think, which then absorb Bambietta's Reishi Blasts. The balls then sail through the air before they reach the Sternritter, suddenly releasing the Reishi and exploding in a powerful blast of fire. As the smoke clears, we see Giselle quickly grabbed Bambietta, using her as a human shield. Bambietta's body is scorched and incinerated as Myri explains what just happened. The device is called a Reishi Locking Device, and it halts the activity of spirit energy that comes into contact with it for a preset amount of time. So the Reishi blasts, upon being absorbed by the spheres, had their own detonations delayed for three seconds. It's honestly absurd that Myri just happened to have this on hand at the time, and he even says so himself. With this technology, he's now completely shut down Bambietta's shrift just like that. As he instructs Giselle and Bambietta to become his research subjects, Giselle summons an entire army of zombies to surround her. These zombies, deceased Shinigami, appear far more like traditional zombies than Bambietta. Their eyes are blank, they emit nothing but low growls, and they seem animalistic. It's cool, though. 
They're the same members of the 11th Division who were once watching Zaraki's battle with Gremi, some of them even being recognisable from those previous chapters. So of course, they're the same Shinigami who were killed by the Bambis later on. Giselle reveals she's been creating zombies since the moment she arrived in the Seireite, a little hint for things to come, and prepares to use her army to continue the fight. At this point, she's also just callously dragging Bambietta behind her. Interestingly, in one shot, Bambietta still has her halo, but no visible wings. However, Mairi claims he can't bear to fight his fellow Shinigami and that he needs the help of someone with no emotional attachment to them. And so as chapter 590 comes to a close, Mairi summons the undead Aranka to his side. Priveron, Espada, Dordoni, Alessandro del Socaccio and Sorucci Sanderwichi, former Sixth Espada, Lupi Antonor and Formi Frax and former Fraxione, Charlotte Coolhorn. First of all, I love this double page spread that signals their arrival onto the battlefield. It's great, and Kubo does a few of these cool, unique perspective shots when featuring the zombified Aranka later on. Secondly, even if I don't personally really care for any of these characters that much, it's an undeniable novelty to see them back, and their fun poses remind you of how much personality many of the Aranka had. On the flip side though, where did they come from? Presumably Myri's lab, but have they just been following him since he left headquarters waiting for their cue? I assume he brought them with him in case he got the chance to test their capabilities on any opponent. It just so happens that they are going to be fighting Shinigami and therefore Myri has the perfect out for facing them himself. But it's cool to see their ever so slightly tweaked designs. They now all have stitches running along their bodies and their outfits, while the same as before, are now slightly ripped and tattered. Again, I can't help but feel like there would have been a few characters more exciting for Myri to have collected. Imagine if this was a squad of fallen Espada that he brought back, like Araniero, Neutra and Stark, for example. Why not grab Xyloporo once you're done with him? It's interesting, too, that Myri was able to revive Lupi despite the entire top half of his body being completely destroyed. I mean, that has to be one of the most impressive feats of restructuring and healing the series has ever seen. If Myri can do that, then why is Kira's wound fixed in what seems like such a rudimentary fashion later on? Ikaku and Yumichika both recognise Lupi and Charlotte respectively, with Charlotte clearly remembering the man who killed him in battle, but deciding to mock him instead. It's cool how quickly Kubo is able to slip back into these characters despite presumably not having drawn them for years at this point, making it feel like only yesterday when we last saw them. Dordoni wanting to meet Ichigo again is a nice touch, as is Suruchi wanting to get revenge on Uryu. The only character who feels substantially different to me is Lupi. Death seems to have mellowed him out somewhat, as he's gone from being a loudmouth, ostentatious braggart to a much more level-headed mediator. Myri then blasts the three of them to stop them bickering, zapping them with an electrical signal he's implanted in them to keep them under his control. However, Myri is pleased, pleased that they were worth the effort of stealing from Xyloporo's vault. And there you have it, one of the series' longest-running mysteries solved at last. The shadowy contents of Xyloporo's lab were glimpsed back in Chapter 306, a massive 285 chapters ago. Looking back on it now, it feels pretty obvious what was in there, and to be fair, I think most of us guessed those legs probably belonged to Sarucci. But it was clear back then that Xylopora was collecting bodies, presumably to gain data on the intruders at the time. However, the mystery was so big that I remember Kubo being actively asked about it, and it being included as a question that will be answered in the final arc, a promise that Kubo made. So, we got that answer at last. Whether it was worth the wait or not comes down to personal opinion. In some ways, perhaps it wasn't. The Undead Iran card don't exactly have a big role to play here, but it's the completion of a fun subplot that ran alongside everything else going on in the world. It's nice to have little mysteries like that to look forward to and speculate on 
even if they don't end up playing a major role in the story. Charlotte mentions that he was a separate find from the other three, after which Myrie tries to blast him for some reason, only for his dramatic pose to change, which does make me laugh. Giselle remarks that Myrie has zombies of his own, but challenges his zombies to defeat her entire army. I like that Myrie uses the competitive nature of the Hollows against them, goading them into battle against Giselle. It's also funny that they say they won't lose to Shinigami when two of these three were defeated by Shinigami in the past. But Dordoni, Saruchi and Lupi then rush into battle, and it's really cool seeing the three of them side by side in these panels. Yumachika protests, saying that these men they're now fighting were once members of Squad 11, but Mayuri refutes him, musing that it's an uncharacteristically sentimental remark from someone of that infamous fight-loving division. After this, though, we see a fleeting glimpse at an interesting side of Mayuri. One who seems to value the military organisation that is the Gote 13 and its ancient traditions. He says that he hopes they don't expect him to show pity to these fallen men, and that he doesn't recall the Gote 13 sworn to protect the Seireite being such a soft organisation. Quoting Yamamoto himself, Mayuri states that it is a soldier's duty to live and die for the Gote 13, and a soldier who does harm should choose death. Perhaps Mayuri is just using this as an excuse, a cover, to kill these zombified men, but regardless he states that those words are Yamamoto's own. Myri has never forgotten them, interestingly, and doesn't expect the others to either. I choose to see this as Myri's own backhanded way of paying respect to Yamamoto, showing that even if historically Myri hasn't been a team player, he does still respect the Gote 13 and its ideals holistically. But I also like that it hammers home the brutal reality of being a member of the Gote 13 itself. This isn't some altruistic, heroic faction of good guys. What makes it so interesting is the bleak shades of grey that come with it being a truly military organisation that values the status quo over the lives of the individual. It's their job to protect the world, to give your life in service of this task if it's required of you. And should you harm the Gote 13 and its efforts in any way, you deserve only death. Even if they didn't choose to become zombies, they're now actively aiding the enemy, and Yumachika and Ikaku shouldn't want anything less for them than a swift end. This ideology, however, is called into question very soon, and I wonder about whether or not it makes Mayuri an open hypocrite, but we'll see in a moment. For now, the Urankar battled the zombies, and I like the attention to detail Kubo shows regarding Giselle's power. Earlier in the battle, he showed Ikaku being splashed by Bambietta's blood, though this is technically Giselle's blood, he didn't transform into a zombie. Dordoni, meanwhile, is dodging the blood of the Shinigami as he fights them, but Lupi tells him he doesn't need to worry. It seems the infection only spreads from Giselle herself. Suruchi splits a Shinigami in half with her weapon and they continue to fight. Just a brief aside, but seeing Soruchi's weapon kill a Shinigami like that makes me wish more of the Aranka were present in this arc, where Kubo had free reign to ramp up the gore and the brutality. Imagine Barragon using Respirar to turn waves of Shinigami into skeletons. We'd finally get to see its full potential. Meanwhile, Giselle reattaches Bambietta's arm as she's then confronted by Charlotte. Again, we get another odd interaction here. Charlotte says he's choosing to battle Giselle because his instincts are telling him they're very much alike, which I think is meant to be another allusion to Giselle actually being a man. What's weird about it, though, is that Giselle clearly presents herself as a woman, while Charlotte has only ever been, I think anyway, just a very effeminate man, sharing far more in common with Yumachika. So I'm not really sure how the two of them are similar characters. Again, though, feeling insulted, Giselle tells Bambietta to attack once again. Bambietta's Volsten dish, by the way, has returned, and the Sturmritter launches bombs at Charlotte, who manages to avoid them all. Charlotte then grabs Bambietta by the face, telling her he doesn't even need to use his sword before flinging her into a building. Now, I get that Kubo wanted Bambietta out of the way so he could bring in the next zombie, but I don't know how this makes sense. 
Outside of Bambietta being gravely injured, she should be leagues above Charlotte, unless he somehow received an enormous boost thanks to being revived. Giselle implies later on that a zombie who was dead before being transformed doesn't move quite as well, but is the disparity really this massive? If so, how did Bambietta so easily defeat Ikaku and Yumachika? Not only is she easily captain level, but she's also using her holy form here. It only gets worse when she re-emerges from the rubble and blasts towards Charlotte only for him to completely obliterate her with a Cero like it's nothing at all. Maybe the fact he's a hollow has something to do with it and her Quincy nature makes her more susceptible to him, but either way it's a strange depiction. I do like the implication though that Charlotte tried to hit Myri when he threw Bambietta into a tower nearby and it's always nice to see a Cero again. Realising Bambietta is apparently outmatched, Giselle calls in her trump card as a new zombie appears. Toshiro Hitsugaya. Yes, in a true twist, Hitsugaya has been ensnared by the enemy, revealing Giselle was the sinister shadow that approached him after he collapsed much earlier in the invasion. Even Myri believes this might make things troublesome, perhaps calling into question his earlier words to Yumachika and Ikaku. Does Hitsugaya deserve death too for turning against the Gote 13? He's even been redressed by Giselle in what feels like another violation, though he does look very cool in his bespoke Vandenreich uniform, interestingly featuring the same rune that the Schutzstoffel will later wear. It's a sickening thought though that Giselle plays with her puppets almost like dolls, doing what she wants with them to the point of even presumably stripping him nearly naked if not completely and giving him a new uniform. It makes me wonder why the same hasn't happened with the other captain level zombies we see a bit later too. Presumably it's because Giselle simply hasn't had that much time with them. But with Hitsugaya arriving on the scene, the tide has shifted. I'll admit, I was impressed when I saw this back in the day. For Kubo to even imply that Hitsugaya might have died was a very interesting and bold move, and it was striking to see such a bright and heroic figure beloved by the general fanbase brought down to such a grim level. As everyone looks on, I'm surprised we don't get any kind of a verbal reaction from Loopy at all, since Hitsugaya was the one who defeated him. I do love the look of eager hype on Giselle's face though, as she's extremely excited to bring Hitsugaya into the fray. There's a cool, expansive shot of the entire battlefield, featuring Myri and Nemu on one side and Ikaku and Yumichika down below, all of them watching as Hitsugaya appears on a nearby rooftop. Ironically though, Hitsugaya becoming a zombie is the most exciting thing to happen to this character for some time. I've made an entire video looking at how Hitsugaya's true potential was unlocked in this moment, how, without any inhibitions, any questions of morality holding him back, he's a completely vicious just killing machine. Immediately he swings his sword, creating a massive mountain of ice that engulfs the battlefield. Yumachika foolishly tries to stop the captain with a bakudo, but Ikaku, realising it's hopeless, smacks his friend aside with Hozaki Maru, sending Yumachika flying. As Yumachika hits the ground with a thud, he turns and sees that Ikaku was caught in the ice while saving him, his leg completely frozen over. As Ikaku chuckles that he's lucky it only cost him his leg, he's suddenly stabbed through the back. Hitsugaya is already upon him, mercilessly attacking the man while he can't move. Yumachika looks on in horror as Hitsugaya yanks his blade back out of Ikaku before slashing him once again. As the captain moves to attack him even more, Yumachika leaps to his defence, locking swords with Hitsugaya. In desperation, Yumachika tries to use his true Shikai, Ruiriro Kujaku, which would have been really cool to see, but I appreciate that he actually tries to use it at all. However, Hitsugaya jams his knee into Yumachika's gut, covering his knee in ice so that it digs further into the fifth seat's stomach. Again, this shows that zombie Hitsugaya is not only more brutal and sadistic than the normal version of himself, but he's actually using his ice with very interesting applications to further his combat ability. Before Yumachika can even react to this, Hitsugaya grabs him by the hair and headbutts him, cracking their skulls together before he slashes Yumachika across his torso, completely taking him out. This is also the second time that Yumachika has been headbutted in the series, as Charlotte did the same thing to him as well. Yumachika lies brutalised on the floor beside Ikaku, the two of them barely able to move in the face of Hitsugaya's true, unfettered skill. 
This whole sequence is great and honestly kind of devastating too, and in my opinion totally justifies Ikaku and Yumichika being here at all. Mayuri, meanwhile, is fascinated. He approaches Hitsugaya, avoiding his attacks while analysing him. Mayuri ponders that since Hitsugaya has no mind of his own, unlike Bambietta, he must have been turned into a zombie before he died. Giselle confirms it, saying turning someone into a zombie before they die is simply better in every way. Their cells are fresher, so they move better, and they lose their mind completely. I've never been sure how that works. Surely if somebody is dead, their mind is totally gone, as opposed to the other way around. But this does go some way to explaining why Bambietta seems weaker overall. As Mayuri wonders what's so fun about controlling someone without a mind of their own, Giselle amusingly remarks that she's not a sadist, so she wouldn't know. Charlotte suddenly appears on the scene, somehow thinking he can defeat Hitsugaya after presumably just watching him decimate Yumichika. Mayuri barks for Charlotte to step away, but he's too late. Hitsugaya carves the Iran car almost in two from shoulder to hip, slicing off his hand at the same time. It's an injury very reminiscent of when Zaraki killed Tesla in Waco Mundo. As Hitsugaya goes to slash Charlotte again, he's blocked by a strange barrier that appears out of nowhere. Nowhere. Mayuri is stepping in at last. Though he decides to leave Charlotte suffering on the ground as punishment, he also can't have Hitsugaya slaughtering all of his test subjects. Deciding to face Hitsugaya himself then, Mayuri asks him if he's alright being used as a guinea pig for a variety of new drugs, claiming it to all be for the sake of the Seireite. There is an interesting theme running as an undercurrent to this fight. This idea of what will you do and how far will you go to serve the Gotei 13 and by extension the Seireite. What does it mean to even be a soldier of the Gotei 13? What value does your life hold? Earlier, Mayuri was waxing lyrical about how turncoat soldiers deserve to die, yet we clearly see him doing what he can to save the lives of Hitsugaya and other captain-level zombies later on. Again, that's the brutal reality of the situation. Can the Gotei 13 afford to lose three captains and a vice-captain? Almost certainly not, so Mayuri does what needs to be done, while the lower level officers are simply expendable. Now this next chapter is very cool and creative, if a little bit conceptual and weird. So basically Mayuri in a nutshell. It's awesome seeing a proper fight between two captains ostensibly on the same side again, something I don't think we've seen for a long time in the series at this point. Hitsugaya launches an attack at Mayuri, who turns into Spider-Man briefly, shooting a defensive webbing from his wrists to try and ensnare Hitsugaya. Leaping into the air to avoid it, Hitsugaya brings his blade down and Mayuri draws his, the two of them locking swords. The way Mayuri draws his Zanpak toe while in the sun suit is awesome, whipping it from the folds of his sleeve. The two of them clash frenetically, Mayuri deflecting all of Hitsugaya's strikes, revealing he's placed a sensor in his Zanpak toe to enable it to counter all oncoming hits because of course he has. Though I'll give it to Myri, this is something he probably should have done ages ago as it just makes perfect sense to have. If he's capable of creating this technology then it absolutely makes sense. It's also not something that only works in one specific situation, it really is a catch-all invention. It's far less far-fetched in terms of the capabilities of the technology than some of the other ways Myri has won fights in the past. To be honest, Maybe every Zanpak toe should be outfitted with this technology in the future. I do wonder where Giselle is during all of this. Presumably she's just observing the fight from afar, but I feel like she could use this moment to try and splash some blood onto Myri while he's busy. Either way, realizing his sword won't work, Hitsugaya tries to ram his knee into Myri instead, but Myri reveals he was baiting Hitsugaya all along, enveloping his knee in a strange purple substance that then explodes, destroying the captain's knee until he simply covers it in ice, quickly applying a temporary heal. As Mayuri attacks him again, Hitsugaya activates Bankai. With a single strike, Mayuri is completely covered in ice from head to toe before Hitsugaya stabs the captain through the chest, ending the fight in a surprising and brutal fashion. Except suddenly, the scene resets. Shocked, Hitsugaya finds himself back at the start of the fight, just before they began battling. 
As Mayuri begins to repeat himself, Hitsugaya attacks him quicker this time, demanding to know what's going on. Mayuri is surprised that Hitsugaya can speak after all, but without wasting time, Hitsugaya activates Bankai once again, immediately freezing Mayuri to the bone. As it was earlier, this is a great showcase for how devastating Hitsugaya could really be if he didn't hold back. And it also, I think, really helps to highlight the gulf in Ice Zanpakuto strength between Hyorin Maru and Sode no Shiryuki. Rukia had to give it her all with her Bankai, almost killing herself in the process to achieve the same effect, essentially, that Hitsugaya gets here in his Bankai with a simple flick of his wrist and no downside. Here, his Bankai actually kills someone for once, and in a flash as well. I love the imagery too of the frozen solid Mayuri, his body shattered into pieces on the ground. But as the ice seemingly begins to melt away, the scene resets once again, taking Hitsugaya back to the start of the fight. It's clear now what's happening as Mayuri explains the truth of the drug he's administered to Hitsugaya. Every time Hitsugaya kills Mayuri, the drug that's coursing through his veins resets his memory, taking him back to the start of the fight. If Hitsugaya doesn't kill Mayuri, he continues on that set path unabated. But I mean, what's actually going on here? Presumably Mayuri isn't actually fighting and dying as this drug would only affect Hitsugaya, not the world surrounding him, so this must all be playing out in Hitsugaya's head. If that is the case though, then what aspects of Hitsugaya's future are real and what are fabrications? How is Mayuri saying and doing new things in each run, like when he realises that Hitsugaya can talk after all? Perhaps what Hitsugaya is hearing here is the real Mayuri observing him from afar as Hitsugaya fights presumably thin air? I guess that's how it's viewed by everyone else around them. I'm really not entirely sure, but it is Mayuri we're talking about here, so it's not a surprise to see such a sophisticated drug and the fact that it's Mayuri just being used as the explanation. But it is impressive. Despite Mayuri not being a physical fighter, as we see Hitsugaya overwhelm him at least twice here in quick succession, it didn't matter. Mayuri had won the battle before it even began. Mayuri reveals that the drug affects the short-term memory, meaning victims have no idea how many times they've been through this cycle, and should they go through it over 10 different times, they then suffer a catastrophic side effect. Right on cue, Hitsugaya collapses to the ground, completely unable to move for 30 seconds, his balance totally thrown off by the drug. But that's all the time Mayuri needs. Lifting Ashisogi Jizo above his head, Mayuri stabs Hitsugaya in the neck, activating his Shikai and paralyzing the captain's limbs now, along with his sense of balance. With Hitsugaya totally unable to do anything, totally unable to resist, Mayuri then injects a new drug into Hitsugaya's neck, causing Hitsugaya to roar in agony as something seeps across his skin. A strange black shadowy-like shroud. As he throws his head back, his terrible, blood-curdling screams draw the attention of several other zombies. Out of nowhere, the zombified Kensei, Rose, and Rangiku all appear behind Mayuri, preparing to step in to save the zombie commander. It's a cool visual, seeing these figures standing behind the shadowy Mayuri, all of them nothing but walking corpses. And this actually does make sense. Kensei and Rose were killed by Gremi, and Rangiku was killed by Kang Du. So unlike Hitsugaya, they presumably would retain their minds, though we don't get to see that. Ironically, them being transformed into zombies is seemingly what ultimately saves their lives in the end. However, Mayuri summons his Arankar soldiers once more and they engage the Shinigami. Dordoni fights Kensei, Rose battles Suruchi, and Rangiku takes on Lupi once again, another blast from the past for the former Espada. Although the panels are tiny, I love the small detail of Rose using Kinshara to block Suruchi's weapon, it's a really cool usage of his Shikai. As the battle continues to rage, however, Mayuri simply looks down at Hitsugaya as the icy captain looks on in terror, his mouth agape in a silent scream, that strange darkness encroaching on his face completely. And then, the battle sort of ends. 
Kubo cuts away from the Battle of the Zombies after a solid chunk of consecutive chapters to instead give us the fight between Byakia and Pepe. Now, the reason he does this does make sense in a roundabout way. Myri and his zombies do later get involved in the battle, rescuing Byakia from a dangerous situation. But this is when things do start to get messy, in my opinion. The battle between Myri and Giselle is simply better than the fight between Byakia and Pepe, and we've invested a decent amount of time in this fight up until now. But Myori's fight has its ending completely truncated and neutered, shoved into a small flashback to ensure it can now fit within Byakia's fight instead. With Byakia cornered by Pepe, the zombified Kensei and Rose suddenly appear, a hefty kick to Pepe's face, sending the Sternritter soaring through the air. Myori arrives shortly behind them, and we get a brief flashback revealing how his battle with Giselle came to an end. We see Kensei and Rose collapse to the ground, clearly affected by the same drug as Hitsugaya. I like the implication, though, that Kensei and Rose were soundly winning their fights, as they're both unscathed while the Arankar are seriously injured. Myori reveals that the drug was mixed into the Arankar's blood, and so Hitsugaya must have been infected when he attacked Charlotte earlier on. Myori then reveals to Giselle what new drug he injected Hitsugaya and then later the other zombies with as well. Myori details his understanding of Giselle's shrift, saying that the amount of blood blood needed to zombify a target varies by their spiritual pressure. A single drop is all it takes to zombify a regular officer, but a captain class fighter requires a lot more, so Giselle's blood has to first reach their heart multiply, and then spread throughout their bodies. This is supposedly why the captains have dark red skin, though the digitally coloured version of the chapters shows the captains with a skin colour that looks to me at least very similar to that of the low-level officer zombies. I definitely think it could have been a more blood-red hue to help with the distinction, but there you go. Myori explains that he has blood samples of every single Seireite officer, which seems a little extreme to be honest, but the new drug he implemented replaces Giselle's foreign blood with a new blood-like substance, so not actual blood, which is presumably what the shadowy veil was cloaking Hitsugaya's skin. However, I do love that Giselle just straight up has no idea what Myori is even saying at this point, so he cuts to the chase. His new drug transforms her zombies into his own. Realising she's lost, Giselle looks on in shock as Kensei and Rose ominously rise to their feet behind Myori, and just like that, Kensei plunges his sword into Giselle's chest, ending the battle at last. I do think it's cool that Giselle remains untouched throughout the entire skirmish, and then the curtain is finally drawn on the fight once she's stabbed just the one time. It's a neat way of emphasising that the puppeteer's strings have been severed, and that because of that, the fight is effectively over. It is odd that Myori then just leaves Giselle's body, though. I thought he wanted her as a specimen to experiment on. Instead, Giselle is allowed to escape because Myori carelessly thought that she died. So while I do think the ending of this fight is a little bit disappointing because I just wish it had been carried on from the remainder of the fight up until then, I am glad that it isn't off-screened entirely. Although this is technically a different fight, Byakia then condemns Myori's treatment of Kensei and Rose, but Myori counters by saying isn't it the duty of the Gote 13 to protect the Seireite even in death? However, Byakia isn't buying it, and it's certainly interesting. When the zombies were being used by the enemy, Myri had no qualms with butchering them, claiming them to be no better than traitors, essentially. But now that he's turned them to his side, well, that's just dandy as far as he's concerned, they're still able to do their job, so Myri will work them to death. Oh, wait. Well, you know what I mean. A couple of small addendums before we wrap up. It's interesting that Myri is parading Kensei and Rose around as part of his Kurotsuchi corpse squad, yet Hitsugaya and Matsumoto are nowhere to be seen. Are they already being treated for zombification? If so, why wasn't that same privilege afforded to the Vizard captains right away as well? We see later in chapter 612 that Byakia has told everyone that Rose and Kensei will be travelling with Myri from now on, and we get a glimpse of Myri placing the two of them 
presumably them anyway, inside his zombification chambers. Although I guess it could be Hitsugaya and Matsumoto, we don't know for sure. If it is Rosen Kensei inside those chambers, then why weren't they taken to the royal palace like Hitsugaya's was? And why didn't Mayuri let Byakia know about Hitsugaya's condition? Again, chapter 612, which is where we get updated on the status of all the current fighters on the battlefield, implies that Hitsugaya is still in trouble as nobody has heard from him at all, but we know he was last seen with Mayuri too. Anyway, that's the end of the fight. It's a fairly lengthy one, and this was a fairly lengthy video. On the whole, I actually do quite like it. As I mentioned, it is overshadowed by Mayuri's next battle, and I think the situation between Yumichika and Giselle is weird and unnecessary, but the actual fight itself is a lot of fun. The zombie gimmick is cool. I appreciated it more when it was confined to the actual battle rather than spilling out onto the rest of the conflict, but I like it all the same. Really, at the end of the day, I don't think this battle needs to be taken too seriously, it's mostly just about having fun with the cameos involved. There's no real growth or development for Mayuri himself, that all comes in his later duel with Pernida. So instead it's mostly just a chance for Kubo to indulge in Mayuri's wacky ways, which I do think is fine as well. You do get to see an interesting, seldom seen side of Hitsugaya though, which is fantastic, and the brutality on display is compelling as well, as seen through the eyes of Ikaku and Yumichika's sacrifices. But this is the penultimate fight of the second Quincy invasion. It's kind of hilarious and a little bit sad that Byakia vs Pepe is the last fight of this part of the war, unless of course you include the goings on in the royal palace, which you're probably supposed to. On the whole, like I said, I enjoy it. Giselle is still a darkly fascinating character, the cameos are a lot of fun and lend this fight a unique flavour, and Mayuri vs Hitsugaya isn't a duel I ever thought I would see. There's a lot going on, it's a bit all over the place, but it's mostly contained in a satisfying way. But that's it for the video guys, I really hope you enjoyed it. What did you think of the battle of the zombies, the fight between Mayuri Kurotsuchi and Giselle Jewel? I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below, let me know what you think of this fight, let me know what you think of the many many cameos that show up in this battle as well, and how you think it all played out. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't done already, give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and until next time I'll catch you later, and I'll see you then.